Good evening. And let us now continue with principles of grammar, the topic of subordination and coordination. Last time we discussed the distinction between main and subordinate clauses. We focused on subordinating one idea or thought to another. And one point I made is that subordination is a crucial device of emphasis. If you have two thoughts and you want one to stand out as important, central, crucial, and the other as lesser, a side issue, uh, merely an attribute of the first, you give one the main clause and one the subordinate clause. So that subordination is basically a means of emphasis. But before we leave the topic of emphasis, I want to discuss some other types and methods of achieving emphasis, other techniques of emphasis. But I want to stress, that's our main topic right at the moment, but I want to stress that the basic technique of emphasis is grammatical structure. In other words, what gets the main clause and what gets the subordinate position. If there's something you want to emphasize, some unit or element within your thought, no rhetorical or literary device will do it unless the basic precondition is met, which is that it occupies the position of main clause in your grammatical structure. That, therefore, I would say is the technique of emphasis par excellence, because that goes to the very structure of your sentence and, therefore, of your thought. Everything else that we would say are simply ways of adding to that, intensifying, and so on. This is the root. One other thing about uh, grammatical structure with regard to emphasis, before we introduce some new techniques. Other things being equal, the more isolated a unit, the more emphasis it gets in the reader's or listener's mind. If you have, for instance, a main clause saddled with three subordinate clauses, that is not as emphatic as the simple main clause stated baldly by itself. Because if it's connected to a whole bunch of subordinate clauses in one sentence, the reader or listener takes it all in as one unit and the act of taking in all these little side issues at the same time dilutes the impact to some extent. So if you have a case where you want powerful emphasis on one thought, over and above simply putting it in the main clause, sometimes it's desirable to make it what we call the simple sentence last time. That is a one single main clause, preferably brief, by itself with a capital letter and a period. And in the right context of the normal type of sentences, that will leap out of the page and hit the reader over the head by the, by the force that you're giving him nothing but one concentrated main clause. For instance, you have a whole discussion of psychology and events and so on, and then you suddenly say as a separate sentence, he was frightened, period. Now that in itself carries an enormous weight because it's terse, it's brief, it's condensed into one bald main clause. Now, of course, if you write all of your sentences that way, you know, that's the Dick and Jane English that we saw, just simple sentences, they lose all their emphasis and then you have uh, an egalitarianism of everything being equally emphatic, which means nothing is emphasized. So you have to have the right context for that. But occasionally, it's helpful to remember to revert to a simple sentence without any subordination uh, to get your emphasis. Now, these are the structural elements of emphasis. What gets the main clause and what other clauses, if any, is it saddled with or connected to? Now, let's look at some other techniques of emphasis just to round out this topic. Well, first I want to look at a poor method of emphasis simply to get it out of the way. And that is italics or underlining, underscoring words or sentences. You know, of course, the underlining in your script would be an instruction to a printer to put it in italics. Now, italics is basically similar in writing to shouting in speaking, or if you were an actor on stage, to get the audience's attention and you start yelling at them. 
Ita and I use some italics per se, you're not attempting to set the context or let the emphasis grow out of the nature of your thought and material. It's a purely mechanical device. And if you use it frequently, it simply irritates an audience and they automatically disregard it. It could be exactly the parallel to an actor shouting on stage in the beginning of the play to the end. It has no effect whatever except to annoy uh, the listener. On the other hand, a very effective actor can whisper. Uh, and if the words and the context are said correctly, each uh, little syllable will reverberate in the audience's mind because you set the context for the right kind of emphasis. It grows out of the situation and his ability. Therefore, I would be very, very sparing about the use of italics. Occasion, as an exception, okay, it's all right. If you have a really central word and you want, in effect, to say to the reader, now we're going to do 20 pages on what is freedom, and you want that word to leap out, okay. Or if you have a really central idea, if you do it sparingly, Occasion, you simply want to say, notice this. All right. But as a rule, I would say good writing means when in doubt, omit italics. My general attitude to all of these uh, copy editing types of ways of achieving effect are they're guilty until proven innocent. In other words, italics are wrong unless there's a special case to be made for their use in a particular copy. Now let's look at two techniques of emphasis over and above the basic structural issue of the main clause, um, uh, which are really the only two you have at your disposal. And those two techniques are word order and repetition. Word order and repetition. And let's take word order first. A word's position in a sentence is very important to the emphasis it gets, the importance it has in the listener's mind. And in general, if I asked you, the most emphatic word is what part of the sentence, word or words? What part of the sentence? If I divide it up into beginning, middle, or end, you know from your own experience, what part of the sentence receives the greatest impact in the listener's mind or reader's mind. The yes. End. The end. The end, absolutely. The most emphatic words are at the end. Next to the end, the most emphatic is the beginning. But the difference in weight between beginning and end is so great that for our purposes we can look only at the end. Can you guess the reason why the end of the sentence impresses itself on a reader much more than uh, the other part. Yes. Because uh, you stop at the period to get a complete thought and that's the last thing that you're holding your mind. Exactly. The period is a stop. The reader stops. And that stop tells him now's the time to mentally digest, take it in, take a breath before you plunge on. That pause gives the words at the end, the concepts at the end, great advantage over the rest of the sentence. They have a chance to sink in and impress themselves <coughs> on the reader in a way that the rest uh, do not. Now this is even true within a sentence before a punctuation mark. So if you have a semicolon in a sentence, you know, you have two parts to it, the words just before the semicolon will be retained and will have a greater emphasis uh, more than the words uh, at the beginning of the sentence say. And this is even true before a comma. Any pause, any punctuation mark uh, denoting a pause, uh, right away will signal a greater emphasis. But this is uh, most uh, clear in the case of a period. Now look at number one. You can come right forward and take a chair. That's OK. Uh, look at number one uh, on lecture three notes that, that you have. Here's the exact same sentence, restated three times, simply with different arrangement of the elements, different end. Read those three and see how the emphasis changes 
according to the position. I believe, however, that you have failed. This is in the uh, context as an instructor speaking to a student. Now, the other thing that enters his mind is, the emphasis is, you fail. The rest is just gets you to it, that's all. Look at the difference between that and the next. However, you have failed, I believe. Now, by the sheer changing of order, what is the net impact? Now, the meaning is still the same after all. It's not as though we forget the first part of the sentence, but the older tone, the emphasis goes to his state of mind. Not that you fail, but that he believes. And now, if you go to the next, I believe that you have failed, however, by pausing on the however, it gives the emphasis to what? This is some kind of exception to what you would have expected. In other words, it takes the term however and gives it a little added uh, stress. Now, in this sentence, in a normal context, only the first is accepted. In a normal context, because these other elements are by their nature non emphatic. However, in a normal context, it would be simply a transition word. I believe is simply an introductory word. At most, it's I'm not sure. But the essence of this sentence would be you fit. And so if you want to write good emphasis, that is your emphasis matching the importance of the content, you would never do the other two, and they would strike you as choppy or uh, un, un, unemphatic precisely because they take content elements that are not important and give them the starring uh, role. One essential thing of editing is when you read over your sentences, usually in a rough draft, it never occurs to you in the order of emphasis. You just blurt out whatever comes to you. And then you read and you see, if I put this at the end, or I took this from the end and put it back somewhere in the middle, I would get a greater punch from the sentence. And your grasping of that is your own inner sense of uh, what is uh, emphatic. You can come right up here. There are seats up here. There's no reason to sit on the floor. Uh, so, as a general advice, save the best for the end. Now, a development of this principle is what is called the periodic sentence. P-E-R-I-O-D-I-C. -I periodic sentence. The periodic sentence. Now that does not mean a sentence that has a period. Obviously they all do. This is defined as a sentence in which grammatical completeness is reserved until the end of the sentence. Grammatical completeness does not occur until the end of the sentence. In other words, in this type of sentence you read a lot. And even when you get three quarters of the way through the sentence, you still don't know the meaning or the essential grammatical structure of the sentence. You're in suspense. You don't know what it all even is saying until you get to the end. And suddenly, when you reach the very end of the sentence, bang, you have complete illumination. You know the whole structure. You know the subject and predicate. Uh, uh, you grasp the meaning only with the ending of the sentence. Now. This is a very powerful technique of emphasis because you not only get the normal emphasis of a sentence ending, but in addition you have the relief of the suspense. The person is read all the way through, holding it all, wondering what it's all about, and suddenly bang, you have given him the answer. Now the opposite of a periodic sentence is called a loose sentence, L-O-O-S-E. A loose sentence is one in which the grammar is essentially completed and the basic meaning is grasped well before the end. You may then go on and put a whole bunch of subordinate clauses, and adjectives, etc., but the essence is grasped pretty early. Now, the word loose sounds pejorative. It sounds like you shouldn't do it, but obviously if you made every sentence periodic, it would be so massive and so artificial your, your readers couldn't stand it. Some 19th century writing is like that. So a lot of sentences have to be unemphatic. You can't, the price of emphasizing some things is that other things have to be less important. 
But as long as you understand that, periodic sentences are a good device. Now look at number two there. It's the same sentence written periodic and loose. Now read it the first time. First is periodic. The leading figure of German philosophy. The author of the Enlightenment. The final destroyer of civilization is... Now we haven't yet got one part of the sentence stated. The subject, and therefore the essential grammar is not presented. And not only you don't know who I'm talking about, you don't even know the essential grammatical structure of this sentence. So the whole thing is just waiting for Kant. And then when you were hit with that, it gets the emphasis of the ending, plus it finally gives you the understanding of the whole sentence. Now contrast that with the next, which is the exact same content, but in a loose form. The leading figure of German philosophy is Kant. Now there you know. You have your subject and predicate, your main clause, it's over. And now you add, and by the way, you're giving us some subordinate clauses. He was the author of so-and-so and the final destroyer of such-and-such. Such. Now that is all in the nature now of an afterthought because it's subordinate, you see, to the essential main clause. Now you see that it doesn't have anything comparable to the emphasis of uh, the first one. That is simply as an example of uh, the role of uh, um, a periodic sentence in uh, heightening emphasis. Now on this same example, I deliberately constructed it to illustrate a second technique of emphasis pertaining to the order of words. Does anybody know, leaving aside now the issue of periodic versus loose, in other words, where the structure of the sentence ends, what other difference is there between these two uh, variants uh, that would affect emphasis? Well, they each have three elements, right? They say three things about Kant. That he was a big shot of, in Germany, that he, uh, uh, he destroyed the Enlightenment, and he wiped out all civilization. Now, in the first one, what is the order of those three? I start with a relatively unimportant fact, relatively speaking. He was a big German philosopher. Well, nobody would, you know, that doesn't attach too much, arouse too much in people's minds. Then I go to, he was the author of the anti-enlightenment. Well, presumably if they know the enlightenment at all, that's a more electrifying, more charged content. And then I go to, he destroyed all civilization. Well, that really, you know, he's like the mass murderer, the mass destroyer, and that is my what? But climate. Now that first would be called the climactic series. Because the order of elements deliberately rises in intensity. Now, imagine that same sentence. Oh, I see I did not give you the other, the anticlimactic version uh, typed out there. But imagine that same sentence in this order if you can. Look down at the page, but just juxtapose the order. And suppose it were uh, written like this. We'll keep the periodic structure, but change the principle of climate. So suppose we said, the author of the anti-enlightenment, the final destroyer of civilization, the leading figure of German philosophy, is Kant. That would suddenly be a complete flat <coughs> anticlimax because you're rising, rising, and then bang, nothing whatever, when you get to uh, the end of this series. And obviously, if you want emphasis, one very excellent technique is climax hook the audience, and then one more intense, and then still more intense. And now if you could combine that with a periodic sentence, so that the climax comes with the structure of the sentence at the very end, that's about as much as you can do by word order to uh, hammer it in. Now one book gives this example of um, um, climax. This would be a proper climate. This is not brilliant, this is forced to understand it, but it's clear, and that's what you want in an example. Your son is very ill, seriously ill, desperately ill. That's good. I mean, it's not a sophisticated thought, but it's a nice rise, as opposed to 
Your son is desperately ill, seriously ill, very ill, and it just falls apart completely. Now that's an anticlimax. In other words, that is the opposite of emphasis, and it's achieved by, in this case, a poor word order uh, in the series. Yes? They say you use a loose sentence, sometimes a variation. Would you use an anticlimax? For no. You would never use an anticlimax for variation. You, you, because you're deliberately going in the teeth of the nature of your series. You don't use a loose sentence for variation as an end in itself. It's not as though you say to yourself, well, this given sentence really deserves a lot of emphasis, but I'm going to, in effect, castrate it just uh, in order to have a balance. You can't do that. In normally, if you're writing in a way attuned to your reader's mind, you cannot take in a whole bunch of emphatic sentences one after the other. It's too much. Remember, the whole essence of writing is the anti-egalitarian approach. The important and then the elaboration, the essential and then the side issues. And this is true also in emphasis. If you want to hit it with calm, it, it would be completely nothing if you then said a whole bunch of sentences like, and the essence of Kant's morality is one word. And then another one again, it's just like a series of blows to the head and it doesn't have any effect. You have to use these when the when your content requires it. If your content requires one every sentence, you are writing a telegram, uh, not, uh, not uh, prose for uh, the normal pace. All right. I say there are other techniques of emphasis involving word order, but I think the most important we've covered, the ending and the issue of climax. Now let's say you're worried about repetition and emphasis. <laughs> Repetition is a great virtue properly used. It's a means of emphasis. The mind rarely takes in something completely the first time. We have to hear something, get an idea of it, relate it to something else we know go on to something else, hear it again in a new context, add in something more, come back to it again. Those of you who know the objectivist uh, epistemology will understand the spiral means of knowledge, the spiral theory movement. Learn something, go on to something new, come back to the old thing that you knew but at a higher level. Well, this is true in all communication, even writing a simple paragraph. Repetition is a very important feature. You know what they define good teaching as. Good teaching is supposedly simply saying the same thing three times. <laughs> saying at the beginning, this is what I'm going to cover, then covering it, and then saying at the end, this is what I have covered. And that is a simple example of repetition to embed something in a person's mind. You have to, to some extent, hammer into the mind of your reader your key ideas and concepts. Now, in the normal case, bald, simple repetition of words is not desirable. It strikes the reader as purposeless. It doesn't achieve its effect. What you want is usually repetition in some kind of different context. Repetition with a twist or a variant or a new aspect so it still is repetition. It's still hammering hold the old idea, but from a new angle, in a new way, and therefore the reader doesn't just tune up and say, this guy is just foaming off at the mouth and saying the same thing over and over again. Now, I have written for you a little paragraph, number three, deliberately illustrating repetition. This is not what I would call prose. Uh, but I'm just doing it as an example. Suppo supposing I had taught students what epistemology was, that is the theory of knowledge. And then I wanted simply to say, now that's what a metaphysics and contrast. Now I'll read number three and see if you can identify the repetitions that I've deliberately put in. Now you see there are two types of repetition in that uh, paragraph. One is the simple repetition of the identical word. And in some contexts, that is essential. Particularly if you have a word like, well, in this paragraph, which word am I thinking? 
Metaphysics, which engenders shudders in the reader. Or if you're writing an economic theory, you say something like modernism for a beginning audience or whichever, it has that same eye-glazing effect that they don't know what it is. They don't want to know what it is. They think it's <laughs> like, you can't know what it is, and therefore they tune out. The only way through that is to hammer it again and again. And therefore, that's why I would not say, since I know metaphysics is one of those words I want not that to enter their mind. I have to get through the barrel, and I need a repetition to bring it in. I say, now let's turn to the branch called metaphysics. Now, I, I don't say it studies the universe as a whole, although that would be clear, or which studies. I, I, that would be clear, but I want them to get the word, so I say it again. Metaphysics studies the universe as a whole. Now, I'm a little shy about saying it in three sentences in a row, so I don't say the nature of reason is not part of metaphysics, because I don't <laughs> want... I think that's a little overdone, and the reader begins to wonder maybe he doesn't know that there are pronouns. <laughs> but then I come back for one last definitive statement. Metaphysics studies, now after three times I figure I've hit them with it enough so it might attach. Now that is simply an illustration of the same word repeat. Now of course if you do it for a word that's unnecessary, it seems enormously verbose and, and poorly written. The other form of uh, repetition uh, which is more common in this number three, is repetition of the same idea, only in different words. And here I repeat four times one different idea, namely what? Yeah. It's reality versus knowledge. It's reality versus knowledge, I say. It's the universe as a whole versus the nature of reason. It's reality versus knowledge. It's facts versus cognition. It's that which is versus how man comes to discover. Now, after you say it four times, presumably that form of repetition per se helps to entrench that thought in their mind. But you see how much more effective, or I hope you see how much more effective it is to do it this way rather than simply if I were to write. Metaphysics studies reality, not knowledge. Reality, not knowledge. Reality, not knowledge. Now that would be a repetition three times, but the repetition would be dead. It would do absolutely nothing, and the reader would think you're crazy. Now what is the, the difference? What do you accomplish by varying your formulation? It's not simply that you want to conceal from the reader what you're doing. Uh, you are actually doing something very essential by varying the form of the repetition. What is it that you are doing? Is anybody? Yes. You're making it wider so that they can they have more to latch on to in comparison to well, their own. You're right in the process, you're giving them more knowledge, but it's not so much that it's wider because facts are not wider than reality, but you're giving them a specific piece of information. Um, what information am I giving them by this method that they wouldn't get if I simply said reality, not knowledge, three times? You're giving them different contexts. Different contexts of what concept, what term? Well, if you just say reality to a person, what is the standard response people are going to give? Yes. I mean, if you say, we study reality, how will people interpret that? Yes. Who's reality? Who's reality? What's reality? You mean some supernatural dimension or whatever, particularly if it's in a paragraph with the word metaphysics. And I want to take the curse off the word reality. I want to make it clear what I mean by reality. Now, one way of doing it is to stop and say, by reality, I mean. There's no use raising your hand because I'm in the middle of I see. One way is simply to stop and give a formal definition, but that has a very pedantic quality. It stops the whole thing, and you have to stop and say, oh, by reality, I mean the sum of that which exists and so on, and you lose your thought. What, real, what the repetition does here it permits you to make your definition of your concepts clear without stopping for a formal official definition. So you're actually feeding them information. What is your view of reality? It's simply the universe as a whole, the realm of facts, that which is, you see. And consequently, by those repetitions, I make my 
essential concept clear, unobtrusive, without having to stop for a fanatic definition, and at the same time, while they're grasping it and getting it in three different times, and the result is I have the emphasis I want to be able to go on. Uh, now, all right. Yeah. Aren't you using uh, also in that uh, number three uh, contrast in those sentences? Oh, certainly. It's, it's mm -hmm. a contrast repeated four times, but here I'm focusing on the role of repetition. Oh, yes, contrast is also essential, but that's not an issue of emphasis. That's my concept. I'm here talking about techniques of emphasis. Yes, yes Louis. Um, Is there a difference in how you define this if you were giving an oral presentation as opposed to a written one? Yes, if you were giving an oral presentation, I would up the ratio or the amount of repetition by a factor of at least three to five. I would get much more repetition because the uh, in a written presentation, the person can stop if he doesn't really get it and reread it. In an oral presentation, he's lost if he doesn't get it. And people take much less in in a written presence, in, in, in an oral form. Therefore, much more repetition is required oral. Yeah. I've, I've often found your lectures very good because you repeat, and as a result, I have time to write down the notes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that per se is not necessary, right? You have to talk slower. <laughs> but but it, is, it is true that an essential of good teaching or communicating is repetition. You say it over and over in different ways. Um, but now, before you get so sold on repetition that you go on saying it over and over, let me add immediately. Repetition, now whether this is whether of a word or an idea or anything, must be purposeful. It must be deliberate. It can't be merely verbosity. Clacking your uppers. <laughs> foaming off at the mouth. In other words, the reader has to be able to tell from the context and the exact wording you use that you have a purpose and that you are deliberately doing something. An accidental repetition is very poor and can be deadly. Now look at number four. Now this happens to be an example of a word uh, repeated, two different words repeated, <laughs> simply accidental, which is one, one example of that. Believe. Now, <laughs> believe in those, two sen in those two are closely related, but they are not the same concept. When you talk about people believing his story, you mean what? Accepting it, being willing to take his word for it. When you talk about him believing, you simply mean what? His mental process. He thought that was his opinion. Now, the word belief can be used for both, but it's very bad if you have a different con content in a sentence to use the same word. It's, a, it's an unconscious equivocation, and it comes, neither word then is emphatic, because one meaning somewhat different from the other just obliterates the exactness and the precision of your communication. Even clearer is what other word in this uh, last part of the sentence that's repeated twice improper? Since. In the first means, because, and in the second means, after, or subsequent. And consequently, you're using the same word. It's a, it's a sheer equivocation, actually. And the repetition with two different meanings has the exact reverse of what you want repetition to do. They just blur uh, each other. This is what you'd call sloppy, inadvertent, unwarranted uh, repetition. So the rule is you have to use different words to stand for different concepts in a given sentence. Even if those uh, concepts are approximately similar, and even if you could use that word in another context, for you would be all right to say, he believed that people would uh, accept his story. That's okay. Or uh, he thought that people would believe his story, as long as you don't repeat it twice in, 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 in uh, 
a different usage in the same sentence. Now, so when you talk about repetition, don't repeat the same word if they stand for different concepts, even if they're very closely related. But now the corollary of that, the other side of the coin, is if it is the same concept, you must use the same word. Otherwise, you are confusing your reader. If you artificially vary a word for no reason other than, you don't want to use the same word twice. You want to show that you have a big vocabulary. So you don't just say name. You say name, uh, tag, appellation, label. And you just keep throwing in another synonym each time. It's completely baffling to the reader who wonders, is this the same thing that you were talking about at the beginning, or why why all these changes? Now, if you've ever seen poor fiction, the classic example of this is the fear of the word said. Now, all you're having is a scene between the man and the woman. I love you. She said, yes, you know, back and forth. And they'll write, I love you, she said. Yes, he replied. Oh, Bill, she has separated. Oh, yes, he affirmed. <laughs> And it's just, all it is, all that comes out is not what they're saying, but, you know, all the different verbs of saying completely swamp the content on the grounds of there's no conceivable reason for this variation. It's the same exact concept, but they're trying to show that they've got a vocabulary and they won't repeat the same word. Now, that is completely poor. If it's literally the same concept, either repeat it or if you find you're overdoing it, you know that you can't overdo a given word. Uh, you go home and take any word like table and say it to yourself 20 times and it becomes more. If you find you're doing that, what you have to do is try to find a pronoun or something that will replace your reference to it. Reorganize the sentence, but not another word which is just arbitrarily different. Yes. Okay, so much for repetition. Now, before we leave the topic of emphasis, I have one last tip with regard to emphasis, which is not any of the things we've discussed so far. I can't classify it, but it's very helpful. It's just the general guidance. Where possible, be positive, not negative, even if your thought is negative. Now, this actually is well put in this book, The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. And uh, they put it this way. <clears throat> they simply have flatly as stylistic principle number 11, put statements in positive form. And then their explanation is make definite assertions. Avoid tame, colorless, hesitating, non-committal language. Use the word not as a means of denial, never as a means of evasion. And he gives this example. He did not think that studying Latin was much use. As a game, he thought the study of Latin useless. Now, it's the same thing. Not much use or useless, but the useless enters easily. It's like a sugar-coated pill. You swallow it right down, and it has a certain force. The negation always has a negative empty quality to it. Something is not true, but it leaves a blank of what is true. Therefore, for emphasis, don't overuse and be careful of negation. And he gives the example, or he says, the reader is dissatisfied with being told only what is not. He wishes to be told what is, which is metaphysically a very valid desire. I add it. Hence, as a rule, it is better to express even a negative and positive form. Thus, not honest is not as good as dishonest. Not important versus trifling. Did not remember versus forgot. Now, I'm not saying that the word not is to be shunned, but it cannot and not be overdone. Now, look at number five. This is just an adaptation of this example. 
It seems to be virtually impossible to take in, but it's a very simple thought. <laughs> it's all simple, but it's too many negatives. Now, let me reword that for you. Simply with the identical meaning. It's a negative thought. I'm not going to make the thought positive. The content stays the same. But just look at it with your eyes as I reword it in the following way. He thought the study of Latin useless. So he usually came late and ignored his teacher, whom he distrusted. Now it's the same meaning exactly. But this goes in straight and doesn't leave you with a sea of knocks. Uh, this is very important in, in editing in a in negative context. There is a great wealth of words in English which have a negative meaning in a positive form without the non involved. And where appropriate, this is a helpful thing. All right, I want to leave the topic of emphasis now and go to a quite different topic. Parallelism. Parallelism. P-A-R-A-L-L-E-L-I-S-M. <coughs> now let me introduce this to you. Writing is matching form and content. Expressing your thoughts in a way that will make your meaning, your emphasis, clear. Now, mostly up to now, we've been stressing subordination. In other words, when one idea, one concept is less important than another. Well, we've been telling you, stay it according. Emphasize one and let the other receive. Now, what would the obvious other side of the same coin be? If two concepts or ideas are equal in importance, then what? Your wording should indicate that. Now, what do we call words or concepts which were equal in importance? We said they were core of an equal order of significance. And therefore, the principle is coordinate expression must be indicated as such. When two things in your context are logically equally important, there's nothing to make you say, focus on this and set this one in the, in the sideline, then your structure has to reflect the equality of importance. This is simply the other side of subordination. And the name for it is parallelism, which is defined as false. A form of expression Well, this is a pretty redundant definition, but I have the word expression twice, but you'll get the idea. A form of expression in which logical sameness, sameness logical sameness is deliberately expressed through structural sameness. Parallelism. Logical sameness must be deliberately expressed through structural sameness. When this happens, you have got a proper parallelism. When it doesn't, we say your parallelism is false because your emphasis does not mirror the actual content uh, of your thought. Uh, Here again, we want form to follow function. Now let's take an example. Look at number six. Now the context here is we have two first prize winners, equal in a competition. And I want to announce the results. And I say, the first was Mr. A and the second was Mr. B. Now, the thoughts are equally important in the context, and I give them the same grammatical structure, namely what, in this particular case. Two main clauses, right? The first was Mr. A, 
and the second was Mr. Bay. I don't subordinate one to the other. It's equally important since so it's a compound sentence in this case combined with an and. That's not the only form of parallelism, but in this case it's a simple form. Now contrast that, assuming now that our issue of emphasis remains the same, our purpose, to the, to the next example. The first was Mr. A, the second being Mr. B. Now I have suddenly switched and given Mr. B short shrift because he no longer has the dignity and the weight of the main clause. He has now got only what? He doesn't even have a clause. All he's got is a participle, being, right? <laughs> so he is in the limbo of highly subordinated. And yet, if my intention is that the two are equal in importance, I am confusing the reader. And the question is, now this is a very simple example, obviously, he'd still get your drift. But the question in his mind would be why that uh, change it would simply be baffling. Non-parallelism, a sudden grammatical shift without any more. Now here would be another form of violating parallelism. Here, the first was Mr. A, and the second's name was B. Now here I give them both main clauses, only for no reason at all, I vary the form of expression. Why do I say it this way rather than the first name was A and the second's name was B? Why do I suddenly bring the name of the second? Now if my context is these two are equal in importance, there is no justification. It simply introduces a vague pocket of doubt or fog in a reader, perhaps so fast beyond what he can even catch, but why this change? Now, obviously, you could imagine a context in which this would be perfectly right, this breached parallelism, if you imagine a special context. You're writing a mystery story, and all of it is about the nefarious activities of B. And he's been absent for a while, and the reader is wondering what happened to him, when's he coming back? And now you get to this sentence and you say, the first was Mr. A, and the second's name was B. Now, here, you're entirely justified in breaking the parallelism because, in that context, they are not coordinates. Here, you want his name to enter their minds. That's much more important, so you're deliberately buried to show that this is a different uh, different element. But in the normal context, this would be poor writing uh, without uh, such a context. Where there is a parallel importance in thought, there must be parallel word. Now, number two under six gives uh, another type of example of the same principle. The first sentence there, is parallel. If you study and if you read the notes, you will do well. Now let's assume that accurately mirrors the thought. There are two conditions. Studying and reading the notes, and then you'll do well in the exam. Well, they are expressed with the same conjunction. If, same subordinating conjunction, uh, and then two uh, clauses. You study, you read the notes. That's clear. Look at the second. If you study, and assuming that you read we suddenly vary the conjunction from if to assuming that. Now, what is the effect of that assuming that? By the sheer fact of varying, you're saying to the person what? It makes it leap out. This is more important. This is not an ordinary if. This is assuming that. Even though it has the same meaning, by the fact of varying, you're calling attention to it. And you are therefore obliterating the equality of importance. And if they really are equal, this would be all the parallel. Or look at the third. If you study, and should you read the notes, you will do well. Now here again, it's the same logical meaning only. What have we done as far as grammatical structure is concerned? If you study, we used a conjunction and a regular verb. If you study, what do we do to express the condition in the second? We have no conjunction, instead we used... Subjunctive. We actually we did use a subjunctive. 
well, you could think of it as the conditional form of the verb. We'll get to that uh, in a later lecture. But you can just see for yourself right here, obviously, we use a different method of communicating a condition without any conjunction at all, no if. And of course, the immediate question would be, in a person's mind, well, why the change? Variety, obviously, is not an end in itself. If two elements are coordinate, you have to painstakingly keep them co coordinate or parallel in expression. Now, if you understand that general principle, you must know to apply it. There can be great differences between the two parts of a sentence and still be parallel. Parallelism is essentially a grammatical issue. It means, really, it comes down to, in practice, using the same grammatical part of speech to start each element of the sentence using the same grammatical structure for each element. For instance, it would be wrong to say if and should you read, as we just saw, because we're using a conjunction and then no conjunction for an actually parallel thought. Or that other one about the first was Mr. A, the second being Mr. Uh, Mr. B is bad because we're using a main clause balanced by a participial phrase, right? There can be major differences, but what you have to do is pair the essential elements. And that means if you have an infinitive on one side, you have to have an infinitive on the other. If you have a gerund on one side, you have to have a gerund on the other. If you have a participle, you have to have a participle. No conjunction, no conjunction. A main clause, a main clause. As long as that's true, there can be huge differences. Look at number seven. Seven is perfectly parallel. Why? Now, if you take this in too narrow a way, you'll say, well, one's after the that, the first sign is simply a pronoun, the verb to be an adjective. And after the that, the second sign is a pronoun, a prepositional phrase, a negative verb, so it's not parallel. You can't apply it that way. This would be absolutely parallel because the essential structure is the same, namely what? He said, now let's say there were two things he said. What grammatical form did I use to express each? What form is that it was wrong? That is a clause, right? What type of clause? It's the object of sentence, what he said, introduced by the word that, in this case. What type of clause is that, remember? Yeah. It's a noun clause. What type is that he, for his part, would not do it? That's a noun clause. So I've expressed the two thoughts in the same structure. Two noun clause. As two parts of the object of said. That's perfectly parallel. Now, if you get that, you won't be tempted to, to think that parallelism means every word in each element has to be the same. The essential structure has to. Now, one of the most important uses of parallelism is with what is called correlatives. Correlatives, C-O-R, R-E-L-A-T-I-V-E-S, correlatives. Correlatives means conjunctions used in pairs. to connect coordinate elements. Correlatives means conjunctions used in pairs to connect coordinate elements. Of course, coordinate, you know, means of the same rank of importance. Now, the classic correlatives are, for instance, both and, not only, but also, either or. Those are con conjunctions that you use in sets of two to combine things which are of equal order of importance. And the rule is you must use the same grammatical structure after correlatives. There's no option about that. Because by the nature of the conjunction, they're, they're designed to combine coordinates. 
and therefore they must match. Look at number eight. Now here the correlative of number eight is what? Not only, but also. And you see that I have a parallel structure in the first one under eight. Why? What do I have after the not only? I have a prepositional phrase with the noun, right? And then a prepositional phrase with the noun. Not only in the selection, but also in the treatment. What do I have if I had said, not only in the selection of employees, but also in treating them? I suddenly switch from an ordinary noun to a? Gerard. To a gerard. And there's no justification. Why didn't I say not only in selecting, but also in treating them? That is, simply is a breach of parallelism for no reason. A noun phrase must be developed by a noun phrase. A gerund by a gerund. Or look at the third one. Suppose I had said not only as regard to selection, but also in treating. Now what is my justification for switching my preposition? These are exactly parallel. So it should it has to be not only in, but also in. Or not only as regard, but also uh, as regard. Now this is a simple example of the need of parallelism after correlative. Nine gives you a couple other, uh, uh, no, nine gives you other examples of the issue of parallelism, not in connection with correlatives. But there's simply more examples. Look at 9a. Why is 9a not parallel? Now, this is not an issue of correlative, 9a. Why is that not parallel? Grammatically now. How many things was the patient told? Two. What is the grammatical <coughs> form of the first? Raise your hand if you know. The first thing he was told, yes, in the back. An infinitive. An infinitive. To call. What is the grammatical form of the second thing he was told? Yes. Uh -huh. A noun clause. Therefore, the patient was told two identical things in identical in importance. Only one were expressing an infinitive and the other in a noun clause. Now, the principle of parallelism would say it has to be both one or both the other. For instance, the patient was told to call the doctor and to discover the diagnosis from him. That's two infinitives. Or, the patient was told that he should call the doctor and that he should discover uh, the diagnosis. Or, you may deliberately decide, I don't want these to be coordinate. In which case then, subordinate. For instance, the patient was told that when he called the doctor, he would find out the diagnosis. You see? But what you can't have is what's written here. Coordinate uh, elements with no indication of subordination, and yet a completely arbitrary value of grammatical structure. Now, uh, another example is 9b. What's wrong with that? This book is three things. Number one is expressed in what grammatical form? What grammatical form is well plotted? Imagine. What grammatical form is profound? What grammatical form is entertained most of its readers? It's a clock. It's a clause. It's got a verb and book is implied subject, so it's a whole clause, right? Thrown in. In addition, if you have a series of three, you cannot have an adjective, an adjective, and a clause. Then, because then you're immediately saying there are not three equal elements. So what would you do if you wanted to recast that? Here again, it depends on what effect you want. You could say, this book is well plotted, profound, and widely entertaining. That's okay. Three adjectives. That's perfectly okay, even though one has an adjective. Or, suppose you felt entertaining is more important, then your structure has to reflect that. So you would say something like this. This book is well plotted and profound, semicolon. It entertains most of its readers. And the fact of breaking it up 
they're saying, this is not a series of three equal. This one, last one, is so important, it gets a whole clause by itself. Now, you'll find many examples of this in the uh, homework, or some examples. And when you do it for next time, I want you to spot the failure of parallelism. Be prepared to tell me why it's a failure. Why is the grammatical switch taking place? And rewrite in a parallel way. And now let's go to another topic. <clears throat> we are here mopping up tonight the various elements of subordination and coordination. And this next topic is very significant, economy. Economy. <clears throat> This is basically an option of subordination, as you'll see. And I will introduce you to this topic. This means writing briefs. But I'll introduce you to the topic by reminding you that the crucial thing in writing is reduction of units. Remember, we already discussed that in the whole topic of subordination. There's only so much a person can take in or hold. There's only so many words in a sentence that he can take in, or so many sentences in a paragraph, etc. You don't have infinity, and he doesn't have an infinite mind. Therefore, you have to be very purposeful. And purpose here means every word must come. It must have a reason for being. Or put it another way, a word is guilty until proven is. No word should be present if the same thought, now the same thought, could be clearly grasped without it. Therefore, other things being equal, in other words, assuming there's no difference in meaning or stress or connotation, a nine-word sentence is per se superior to a ten -word. Now, I simply put on the side, if you have to use a terrifying Greek or Latin polysyllable to get rid of a couple of short English words, that is not an advantage, because you just, you know, have a huge mouthful of a stuff to read or anything. But other things that you believe leaving that aside, the fewer units you have, the fewer words to clutter the mind or the structure of the sentence, the better. Now, Strunk and Way are also good on this point. They have a very brief economical description of the principle of economy. Now listen to how terse this description is. The principle is, quote, omit needless words. That's it. And then, the paragraph explaining it is, vigorous writing is concise. A sentence should contain no unnecessary words, a paragraph no unnecessary sentences. For the same reason that a drawing should have no unnecessary lines and a machine no unnecessary parts. This requires not that the writer make all his sentences short, or that he avoid all detail and treat his subjects only in outline, but that every word tell. That's it. And that's a very economical uh, description. Whatever, therefore, you can draw without jeopardizing the sense uh, or the emphasis of your sentence is a virtue. And this is called economy, the art of reducing verbiage. It's a special art. Now, as a thought originally occurs to you in the process of thinking or writing your first draft, it's usually loaded with needless words because you don't know exactly what the thought is. You're just getting it birth. You hesitate over a term. You state a couple of words to yourself. You put maybe two or three down synonyms on the paper. You're not sure which is right. You start a construction, you pause to grow, you repeat it again, and so on. 
to finish your draft and eke out the thought. Then when your draft is done, one thing you have to do is look at it and say, what can I strip away from this? What words now have no essential function? In other words, the sentence would stand fully uh, without. And that type of editing is really an exercise in unit reduction. If you took a whole course in style, presumably one thing you would learn is all the different techniques of compressing so that your sentences are completely purposeful. Now here I'll just touch on a few points. Because there are many techniques of economy, but for instance, one is simply omit words that are needless. Uh, you'd be surprised how often you can do that. Look at number 10. There is no doubt but that he is tall. Now, how could you, with the same need, make that much more brief? Trying to get somebody different. Yes. He is tall. Well, <laughs> if you simply said he is tall, that would certainly be the brief. But suppose you had a context where you wanted to say, I'm not in doubt about this, where it became important not only to say the fact, but communicate your mental conviction. You can still do it much more briefly than, there is no doubt about that, which is six words. Good. He is doubtless tall. Doubtless he is tall, right. No doubt he is tall. Now, what about, um, after he comes in, he then takes off his clothes. Now, one word cries out to be deleted from that sentence. It begs to be exterminated. Which word? <laughs> Bad. That is terrible. Why? There. You start off with after. You've already said after. Now, either you, you, you and your reader know what you're saying or not. If they don't pay any attention or you're not, there's no use right. If they do, it is completely gratuitous and confusing to throw it in again. So then it's completely unjust. Now, there are contexts in which comes in is okay, takes off his clothes is okay. If you want, you know, a uh, sort of colloquial context, but if you, if space was an end in itself, and that's an exercise here, how could you reduce even those? Comes in, could be made. Enters. Enters. Right. Right. Now, that's not always better, because sometimes you want the familiarity that comes in. And it's very typical of English to throw in an adverb after a verb. See, uh, so instead of enter or arrive, you say come in. But for brevity, it's very, particularly if you get a sentence cluttered with a whole bunch of little words, one crucial thing is there is almost always in English a verb in place of the one that ends in an adverb, like enter instead of come in. Uh, subtract instead of take away, etc. Uh, if you find it, you get rid of a lot of little particles floating around and mess up your sentence. What could you do with takes off his clothes just as an exercise in a, abbreviate uh, at the very back? Strips. Strips. If you suppose you want something a little less racy in connotation, <laughs> disrobes, undresses. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now, the next is an, a sentence I wrote, actually, of a grade, I don't know, four, or something like that, and I never forgot the teacher's comment. That was my first introduction to this principle. <laughs> As she wrote in the margin, say it once, and uh, had underscored the way I said something three times. Now, what did I say three times? It's not the three virtues, but... This is, I think, on Columbus or John Cabot or one of those explorers. We have to do a paper on the qualities of an explorer. But it really it taught me something because what was I saying three times or how? These three necessary. Well, one is I'm saying they're necessary. What else? Essential. Essential. What else? Must have. Yeah, they must have, have them. Right. Now, this is very sloppy and poor repetition. 
because it sounds like there might be unnecessary abstentions. Obviously, there can't be. And therefore, in this context, it's like saying she's a pretty, beautiful woman. That's distinct from an ugly, beautiful one. <laughs> and it simply, instead of intensifying her repetition, it just weakens it and destroys it. So you have to make up your mind. So you could say these are three, three virtues are essentials to an explorer, or are qualities an explorer must have, whichever, but one. What is wrong with this in the normal context? He is a man who always does his best. Edited on the spot. You know those nominating speeches, he is the man who, etc. Yes. He, instead of that he, whole man. He does his best. Now, there are limited rhetorical contexts where you want to stress the man who, the man who, but in the normal case, just that he does it is quite sufficient. Or, what about, this is used for fuel purposes. <laughs> now that is the type of thing that is completely without redeeming you. <laughs> when you can simply say it is used for fuel. Now, those are, uh, what about this one? I didn't type all these out because some of them are simple. Bill was profoundly sorry to learn of whatever his son's accent. Profoundly so. Now there is two words. And the profoundly was necessary because sorry wasn't strong enough. So the writer chose a bad word. It wasn't, wasn't as strong enough as he wanted. And then he felt he needed an intensive before it. So he ended up with two words in place of one. English has a marvelous range of vocabulary. And if he chose a word that was more strong, more evocative, he would not need the profound. For instance, he could have said Bill was devastated, devastated grieved, yeah. uh, heartbroken, desolate, or whichever, and then he wouldn't need very on top. Most of your varies uh, and your intenses, profoundly, intensely, greatly, etc., come from the choice of a wrong word to begin with, and then you try to make it up, and you can abbreviate by choosing the right word. I'll give you one more example here to do on the spot. The fact that he did not succeed deranged him. Um. Now, instead of the fact that he did not succeed, what obvious simple thing would take his place? Tough. Failure. His failure deranged him. Now, there I have one noun in place of what type of construction? The fact that he did not succeed is? Is a noun with a whole uh, uh, clause, more than a clause, that it did not succeed. And yet I've taken the whole thing and put it into a noun. So I've, what we could say reduced a clause to a noun, to one word, you see. Now that is a very essential technique, and that's the technique of economy we want to focus on. You can change your construction, there's a whole scale of less and less verbiage, ranging from a main clause, which is the biggest, all the way down to one word. And if you know that, you can condense, you can economize by simply reducing it down the chain. Now look at the, as an example, number 11. Number 11 has 28 words, take it from me, I count it. Read it. The tourists drove for a period of three days, and they then arrived in Padua. This is a bustling city, and it is located quite close to Venice. Now, this is the way a lot of people write. And what grammatical structure is it? They drove and they arrive, this is the city, and it is located. How many main clauses? Three. Four main clauses in this sentence. The tourists drove, they arrive, this is the city, it is located. 28 words. But it isn't a sentence. It really isn't a sentence. Why isn't it a sentence? Well, it should be at least two sentences. No, no. 
Sammy Cole is permitted. At the Padua, you have a totally different quote. No, no. Not if in his context he might conceivably want a reference to the nature of Padua to be part of that sentence, to enter his mind as one unit. They entered Padua, which was this kind of place. That depends on the context. You could never make a rule that whenever you get to a city, you must have a news method to describe it. It depends on the context. So there is definitely a place for semicolon. But the problem with this is there are many, too many, many <coughs> costs. There is no, uh, uh, no attempt to subordinate. And the result is you've got many, too many. It is, and it is, and it is, and they did. That's called excessive predication, subject and predicate, subject and predicate, subject and predicate. Now, how could we reduce this? Well, suppose, for instance, instead of the tourists drove for a period of three days and they then arrived at Padua. Suppose we just decide that our main clause is what? They arrived at Padua. So we're going to make the first a subordinate clause, right? And we don't need after they drove. What would be a way of getting rid of the verb altogether by keeping the exact same meaning? Instead of they drove, the tourists drove, we simply have to say after driving, which would be what? A partisan, after driving for three days, for a period of three days, they arrived at Padua. I have cut out one main clause. Now let's condense that even more. We have to put in an after, but we don't need the words of the tourist at all. After driving, what else can we omit in the beginning part of this? Yes. A period of, a period of is completely unnecessary. After driving for three days, the tourists, we don't need and because we're not conjoining anymore, we're subordinate. They, we don't need because we use a partisan. Then, we don't need because we use after. The tourists, well, instead of arrived at, let's kill off that preposition and simply make it the tourists reached, reached Padua. Now, what can we do with the rest of this? This is a bustling city. Do we have to make a whole main clause out of that? Do we have to make any type of clause out of that? Why couldn't we just simply say, reach Padua, comma, a bustling city? What type of construction is that? One noun right after another noun. A and a positive, right. Kill off the whole clause. And what about, and it is located quite close to Venice. What could we do with that? A bustling city, kill off the whole main clause and simply make it a bustling city close to Venice. We don't need and it is located. And in fact, close to, you could reduce to, yeah. near. So if you rewrote this, it would become, after driving for three days, the tourists reached Padua, a bustling city near Venice. That's 14 words, 50%, one half of your original. And the main method of doing it is to, what's called, reduce your predication. There's a whole scale. The longest, most emphatic, and usually the most wordy is a main clause. Then comes a subordinate clause. Uh, then comes simply a phrase instead of a main clause, or a single word, and you end up finally maybe with one adjective. And you can go down a whole scale by what's called reducing predication. Instead of a full main clause, a subordinate, or give up the subject and verb structure and make it just a phrase, or give up even the complexity of a phrase and make it just a word. That is the most single effective technique of cutting back on verbiage. What you do is take your lesser elements, and you see subordinate them, but you subordinate them continuously going down in steps. And you may even subordinate to the point of finally deciding it isn't even worth keeping in the sentence at all and drop the whole thought. Now look at number 12, which I made up to illustrate this. Now this is the same thought reduced as we go. 
That is the predication, the subject predicate structures are reduced. Number one is the worst. We gazed at the water of the lake and it was as clear as crystal. Two main points. Now what have we done? All we helped in the next one, all we did is get rid of one word, but we started on the way down. What did we do now with the next one? Yeah. Subordinated the we subordinated the second. So it's just we gazed at the water of the lake, which was as clear as crystal. So instead of a main, we have a subordinate, and it's slightly briefer and more one unit. We don't have two elements, you see, combined. Now, the next, I have to change the order to get it to the next step. The water of the lake, clear as crystal, held our gaze. Well, now we don't even have, for the clear as crystal idea, a clause. All we have is what? A phrase. Clear as crystal, that's all. We've, we've lost our verb, we've lost our predication, our subject predicate structures. Now, clear as crystal, however, is still a whole phrase. What if we try to get rid of a phrase and say, we gazed at the crystal clear water of the lake. Now we just have one main clause, and instead of it was clear as crystal, we compressed it to a compound adjective. One word, not even a phrase, although to be sure I could. And now, of course, for the finale, get rid of the part in parentheses. We gazed at the crystal lake. Now, unless there's a context where the audience would think it's made of crystal, this would be the briefest, tersest way. And you see how we've gone down uh, in steps squeezing out from a main to a subordinate to a phrase to a word. Now this is a very valuable uh, technique. Of course, there may be contexts where you want to write leisure, where this is too fast, this sentence, these later sentences, or you need a certain kind of emphasis or connotation. But other things being equal, Brevity is an end in itself. I repeat that. Other things being equal, brevity is an end in itself. A lot of editing is simply squeezing your thought down into the fewest words. And uh, I think it's worth the time to lose even a few words. If I can get a sentence down from 15 to 12, I'm quite happy. Or from 10 to 8, I think that's terrific. You know, I've, I've killed off... Um, a lot of these little things that are making it harder to take in. Now again, in the exercises, I've given you some uh, uh, wordy ones which will require omission or actual re of words or actual reduction of predication. Let us take a break here, and I have one more theoretical point before we take up the accumulated homework after the break. I have one last theoretical point this evening before we take up homework. It's in the form of a uh, addendum to the discussion of economy. You should cut out the fat, but not the muscle, as they say, or bone. Don't economize at the expense of logic or grammar. Don't cut out words that are essential to express your thought or to complete your grammatical construction. A thought which violates, a sentence which violates this, that is, in which either the thought is not completely stated or the structure is not completely expressed is called a incomplete thought. And it actually, in some of its instances, is one of the very worst forms of bad thinking that's possible. An incomplete thought a thought where a word or words essential to the communication of the thought is omitted. And you see therefore why this is put as an addendum to economy. When you cut, be sure you don't cut out the essence of the thought or the grammar. Look at number 13 for some examples. In my years at school, I have written many final examinations and I always feel stark terrible. 
Now this is exactly the way people write. This is poor. This is beyond being simply inadequate. This is very poor because it is completely misleading. As worded, the person is saying what? There are two thoughts, two main causes. I write exams and I'm always terrible. Now, by structure and by wording, by wording, it could just as well be, I've written many final examinations and I always enjoy sex. <laughs> it's just two thoughts, that's all. There's no connection between these two. And yet the person obviously wants you to get the idea, what? That the terror has something to do with writing the exam, but he doesn't say it. He has omitted an essential element of the thought. Not the grammar, this is perfectly grammatical in construction, but it is an incoherent thought because unconnected. Now what element is he omitted, which makes all the difference between writing which is sharp, in focus, easy to understand, and writing which is blurred, opaque, out of focus, and leaves the reader feeling it's incomprehensible. What words or what type of words are omitted that you could add that would make the whole thing clear. In my years at school, I've written many final examinations and what? They have caused me. They caused me, or and when I do, or and uh, on every occasion, on every such occasion or whichever. In other words, something, some form of wording to indicate that the terror is connected to the exam. This would be called, this is a classic, simple example of an incomplete thought. If you imagine page after page written in this method, which is how a great many people write, it's all swims. You get an idea that there's exams and terror, but what the connection is, you just don't get. Now, here you can guess that when it's more abstract material, it's harder and harder to take in. It's one of the main reasons why um, writing is, is, is so difficult for people to follow other people's writing. Now this requires that you think literally, literally. The person here says, I've written many exams and I always feel, without any other qualification, the second is simply a literal statement of his universal emotional state. You must write as though you're going to be read literally. Now, if, if you're implying something and you don't state it, that violates this principle. Now look at the next. Russia, this is exactly the way students write. Russia is an excellent example of no element of individual. It's just the way students write. I mean, assuming they're right wing students. Uh, uh, now what is wrong with that? What is individualism? It's a type of social system. Is Russia a social system? No. Russia is not. Russia has a social system, but it is not a social system. What is it? It's a country, which means there's people on territory with the government following certain principles, which is a social system. But Russia is not itself a social system, so it's not an example of no individual. What would you have to do to make your thought literal? Actually express your thought. Russia is an excellent example of, of, a, country that of a country with no element of individual. A country which lacks. A country without. You must state your thought literally. This is the most really one of the most crucial principles of proper writing. It's a shame to put it on at the tag end of economy. Because in a way it's more important than economy. It means thinking literally and expressing the exact meaning of your thought. So that the reader doesn't have to guess, add in, get a feel. You actually tell them one word at a time what you mean. And that makes the kind of writing that you can read right through with luminous clarity. And what makes that luminous clarity is it's always a complete, not an incomplete thought. Now these first two examples are by far the most important because there, in different forms, the essence of the thought is not expressed. 
The third example is simply grammatical incompleteness. It's not as important, but it still comes under incompleteness. What is wrong with, she was as loud, if not louder, than her sister? Yes. Well, it needs the word as. It needs the word as after love. Why? We have two expressions running into one word, her sister, right? She was as loud as her sister, if not louder than her sister, right? So the her sister does double duty. It comes after the loud, it comes after the louder, right? Could you write, she was as loud her sister? No. What do you call it when two expressions run together into one ending, like into her sister? They flow together, do you know what that is called? A confluence. C-O-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E, -E, a confluence. And the principle is confluences must each be closed. They must each finish and run into the end. Could this verb be the same if the verb was something like spoke instead of was? She spoke as loud still as her sister. You still need the S. You see, confluence? confluence is two elements running together side by side to the same termination. As loud, and if not louder than, run together into her sister. Each must be completed so that they can go directly into sister. So this would be grammatically incomplete. She was as loud as, if not louder than her sister. Now that's very often. And so usually the way people would prefer to write would be what? She was as loud as her sister, comma, if not loud. There are some examples, as you'll see in the homework, of incomplete thoughts. Yeah, is the reason that uh, this way is, is awkward because um, you're breaking it up and you're not putting... Um... It's awkward because you're delaying the thought right. too long. There's no need to have the whole other, if not louder than, because the essence is she was as loud as her sister. You see? And therefore you're taking them aside and holding up the development. So it strikes, and also it's a lot of little particles, as, as, if, not, then. And a whole pile up of particles, it's too much to take in. So it strikes you as odd. As I was saying, it, the homework gives you three types of examples. Faulty parallelism, incomplete thought, or wordiness. And I would like you to identify them for next time and rewrite them uh, correctly. All right, now let us turn to, yes. When you were writing your book, did you constantly, consciously think of these things as you were writing them? No. Or do you have them all out of the time? Absolutely not. I, I'd like to emphasize that because if you think that you'd have to think of these things consciously while writing, You'd be completely parallel. <laughs> the only thing you can think of while writing is the subject matter. That's it. The mind is finite. It's pro-epistemology. So you, none of this at all should be in your mind when you're writing. You just wipe it out altogether. Where does it come in? Before and after. Like you're taking a class, doing a homework, you try to make it part of it. After, when you look at what you've written and you want to improve it for editing purposes, you can go over. I used to have a little rule, a little set of things that I did. Like I had one editing only for emphasis, one editing only for repetition, one editing only for you know clarity or whichever, until I got to the point where I felt I could carry all of them at the same time. I would deliberately edit over and over with a different purpose in mind, but that's only in the editing. Uh, only when you're now saying, well, I've, I've said my piece, now can I make it better? But if you try to think of any of this when you're writing this disaster, you'd be much better off never to take a course ever than to try to think of it when you're sitting at the desk. When you sit to write, your mind has to be only you and the subject, and the idea has to be you're the world authority, you know everything, you're the greatest writer in history, because it's very hard to write. If you put any 
doubts, and I must get the subject to it on top of that. People all said, you shouldn't be this, and you should do that, <laughs> and you're finished. You're paralyzed. You just couldn't do it. Does it make any difference what order you would do that editing? Well, I think there's a lot of options, but uh, 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 I would say to make this brief edit first for clarity. Are you really stating your thought? Is this, is this what you want to say? And after you've got that down, then you can go over for such things as repetition, emphasis, you know, grammatical completeness or whatever. But the crucial thing is, first of all, do you say what you want to say in the order you want to say? All right, but that's a whole separate course of itself, and I really am eager to get to the homework from lecture one. Yeah, we have to not do the homework on the bottom, and I never forget. <laughs> there were three examples, three sentences. Prefixed with identify any errors in the use of modifiers. We'll return to that part. <laughs> Homework for number one. The bell sounded loudly and clearly, and still waters run deeply, but even so I feel real well. <laughs> now, if you go back to lecture one, we were talking about the parts of speech. And here there are wrong parts of speech used. Who can name one and tell me why? It's not hard, but just to show you that you can get some cash value even out of knowing the parts of speech. <laughs> Who can name an error in that first thing? It's in the But after sounded, you need adjectives? After the verb sounded, you take adjectives. Sounded is one of those verbs we mentioned that is like was. It does not indicate an action, but a state of the thing. It's really how you perceive the thing, but the thing itself is not acting. And after a verb to be, a verb indicating state, you always take adjectives, not adjectives. Is that the difference between intransitive and transitive? No. It's not. And I'm not going to tell you what the difference is now either. He's skied is action, but it's intransitive. Okay. So it should be the bell sounded loud and clear. What next is wrong with this sentence? And still waters run. Now the waters don't run because they're still. So this is not an action. This is simply a way of indicating that they are. And after that type of verb, you take an adjective. So it should be in still waters run deep. But even so, I feel well. Now feel is not there the verb of touching. But it merely indicates I am, my state. And therefore it should be I feel good. Now what else is wrong in that? Real. The real is a modifier of an adjective. So it should be <coughs> an adverb. So it should be I feel really good. That's simple, but just as an example. Now let's look at two. Two introduces a much more important issue. Are you going to talk about two? No, I was just going to make a point about one. That's not even a, a sentence. Uh, I mean, it's a sentence, but the thoughts are totally disconnected. It's a very poor sentence. If I had only uh, <laughs> illustrate this point. Number two. Now, two repeats four times an error which is egregious and noxious. Also bad. <laughs> what is the error? Does anybody know? Four times I did it deliberately in this sentence. This is the way psychologists write today, bureaucrats, educators, all that jargon that simply goes past the mind, no one can take it in. The technique of it is exemplified in number two. You have nouns coming together. Nouns juxtapose, what's called a noun pilot, two or more. What is the first example of that? 
Vacation dissatisfaction. Vacation dissatisfaction. Vacation is not an action. This vacation dissatisfaction does not communicate anything except if you guess that he means what? Dissatisfaction with your vacation. What's next? Recreation planning. What's recreation planning? Planning What's recreational planning? I don't know what that is. Planning that you enjoy? Planning as a hobby? Planning of one recreation. Recreation planning means planning for your recreation. Planning of your recreation. What's mathematics, students? <laughs> students of mathematics. Could you say mathematical students? No, obviously not. That's why it says mathematics. What, what is philosophy principle? A principle of philosophy. Now, these noun pilots, a noun by its nature is a substance, it's a thing the mind focuses on. An adjective or a prepositional phrase gives you the kind of thing it is. If you write with a noun and then appropriate modifier, there's no problem. But if you pile up nouns, you use a noun as an adjective in place of either an adjective or a phrase, you do an essential violation to the nature of language, because you're giving two substances together, and we're supposed to understand that one modifies the other. You violate the very nature of the entities, and the consequence is that you paralyze uh, thought. Now, the best person on this is foul. You might have to read one passage. Now, you understand that we sometimes do do that. There are cases where you need an adjective, and there wasn't one, and consequently, a noun has come to take on the function of an adjective. And he recognizes that, so you cannot make the rule. Two nouns together, like this, are always wrong. But it depends. Uh, I'd like to read you what Fowler says from this book that I've quoted before because he is very good at it. There is nothing new in putting a noun to this use, that is, adjective use, when no convenient adjective is available. Examples abound in everyday speech. Government department. Two nouns. One functioning as an adjective. Nursery school, television set, that can't be televised set, the set isn't televised, uh, and innumerable others. But the noun adjective, useful in its proper place, is now running riot and corrupting the language, which is a modest statement if you read what comes out of modern psychology or modern educators. Continue to follow. This practice is throwing serviceable adjectives onto the scrap heap for no reason. Why, for instance, should we speak of an enemy attack when we have the adjective hostile? Or a luxury hotel when we have the adjective luxurious? luxurious. Or a novelty number when we have the adjective novel? But what is worse it is making us forget that to link two words together with of may be clearer than to put the second before the first. And he gives this example. Nursery school is legitimate, but what about nursery school provision? Nursery school <coughs> provision, that's the three. Nursery school provision. And as he put that this is an ugly and obscure way of saying provision of nursery schools. What about this? A large vehicle fleet. Now that is really typical of the noun pilot. Large is an adjective. And then vehicle fleet. And you see that that is intrinsically ambiguous. Why? It can mean what? A fleet of large vehicles. A fleet of large vehicles or a large fleet of vehicles. Now, which, that typical way that people write today that commit this construction, 
is to stick two nouns together with some kind of adjective, and it becomes impossible to know to which element in the pileup the adjective applies. Um, and for that point of view, he suggests, and I certainly agree with him, that aside from the clear-cut cases, a juxtaposition of nouns is simply <coughs> impermissible, and it would be much better to try to have adjectives where that's the intention. He, for instance, objects even to such expression as the world situation. And he has convinced me of that. And that the old state of the world was much more effective rather than this uh, noun pile. Now, if you want the extreme of that, look at number three. This is an actual headline. There's five nouns. Millen refuses bank rate, rise leak pro. <laughs> no. What happened? Apparently there was a, a there's a bank which had a rate of interest, and the rate arose, so there was a rise in the rate at the bank. And then someone from the bank leaked the fact that there was a raise, so there was a leak of the rise in the rate at the bank. And then the government decided to investigate the leaks, so there was a probe of the leak of the rise in the rate at the bank. <laughs> now you see, that is barely <laughs> graspable, even with prepositional phrases, but <laughs> put five nouns is finished. It's simply wiped out. So that is like the arch example. And supposedly one of the, uh, the, the real sources of this uh, now I'm piled up as headlines to see where they don't have room for prepositions, so they get you accustomed to them. And I would suggest as a <laughs> modest exercise to um, look to the headlines of the daily paper and see if you can discover noun piles. Is that really invalid as a headline? Yes, I think it's unintelligible. It's put, I think it's completely unintelligible. What would you say for headlines? I, I wouldn't try to rewrite it offhand. You could, but you could say I'm McMillan. Sure you could, but, but I think it's very unclear of communication is the standard. Uh, we have to be something like, McMillan refuses bank probe, something like that. Even that's two, but five becomes ridiculous. Why should the headline tell you the whole story? No, yeah, in, view of, of, in view of newspaper headlines, I think if you, if you use commas or various marks that it would become intelligible in that context of the do headline. The thing with that was commas. If you put of, a semicolon or a period after every one of those, you couldn't do it. <laughs> Not with that combination. It puts some dots between you. Just remember, well, the only thing you could do is put an asterisk beside each one at the bottom of the page. <laughs> <laughs> say the prepositions omitted on. <laughs> All right, I want to go on to uh, lecture two. The homework from that. Now here we have examples of errors in subordination of the use of conjunctions. And I want to simply indicate how they could be rewritten appropriately. Now if you're rewriting, well, it's not identical to everybody else, and it's not necessary to take us through the details of everybody. Try and use your judgment only if you think there's something really different about your way uh, suggested, so we can get through some of these. All right, tell me the error and then what you would do about it with number one. Yes? Um, the way it's written, it sounds like the college educations are out of work. Correct. So therefore, it's what error? Uh, error of uh, misplaced modifier. Right. And the modifier in this case is what type of construction? Um, that are out of work is what type of construction? Oh, now. Uh, no, it's not a noun. I, I took it back. I wasn't. <laughs> it was an adjective <laughs> modifier. Right? Yeah. It's an adjective. What type of educate or what type of thing? Something that's out of work. So this is a an adjective clause misplaced. Obviously, it's intended to modify boys. How would you rewrite that? Uh, thousands of boys with college educations are out of work. Okay. Uh, you changed our main clause. You changed the emphasis. 
but you, you put it in a good position, but you've changed it now to thousands of boys are out of work. By the way, they're boys with college education. This one said, there are thousands of boys with college education. By the way, they're out of work. You see? So it depends on your emphasis, but at least you got rid of that problem. Did somebody rewrite it differently, keeping the same basic structure? How? There are thousands of boys who are college educated that are out of work. Who are college ed educated that are out of work? Yeah. Well, that's not misplaced, but it's very often because you've got two subordinates right after each other. Uh, and you switch from a who to that for no reason, so you violated parallelism. Uh, and consequently, I don't think that's too good. It's not ambiguous, but it's not too good. Why do we have to restrict ourselves to that are out of work? Let's throw in a little economy here. Is there one word that could cover that are out of work? Unemployed. unemployed. How about just there are thousands of unemployed boys with college education. Strip it down. Yes. Thousands of college educated boys. Make it even briefer. Then you need something. <laughs> no, are out of work. Are out of work. Well, that's what she said. Uh, yes. You just changed then the emphasis. All right. Um, by the way, before we leave that, what word? What one word is the subject of that sentence? Simple subject. Boys. Yeah. Wrong. Whoever said boys is wrong. Yeah. Boys is the object of the preposition of. That it makes the prepositional phrase of boys. What is the subject? Yeah. Thousands. Right. So remember that. You have a word with a modifier, modifying phrase, the subject is the, the single word. Thousands are out of work. Okay, number two. I'll take a volunteer if anybody knows what's wrong. Now it's obvious, given that these exercises test the preceding lecture, and you see a certain word in this, you know I think that's wrong. Which word leaps out here as being the one being tested? Uh, the back, yes. Like is the incorrect conjunction. Like is wrong. In fact, like is not a conjunction. Like is a prepositional adjective or adverb. Why is like wrong here? This is tricky to explain. Why? There's no verb. We had the rule that if there's no verb, you can use like, because presumably it goes with a noun in the 20s. Now, this is tricky to explain. This is one of those esoteric applications of the rule which you deliberately put on the tests to expand uh, your mind. Yes? You should denote that you're in a certain time frame and it's not like it, but you are in it. You are sensing something very true. Now is not like 20s. Now is the time you're in now, and the 20s is the time you were in then. So the real parallel in your thought is now versus in the 20s. In other words, what part of speech is now? It's an adverb. And what type of function does in the 20s have? It's also a time specifier. It is an adverb. So your relationship here is between two adverbs. The in is implied. The like only as a preposition can govern a noun and a pronoun, not an adverb. Prepositions can only govern noun and pronouns. Can't say in now. And therefore, you really are implying now as was true in the 20s. See that? Consequently, you have to say as in, and you can leave was true to implication. In other words, like has to govern a noun or a pronoun. And although the word 20s is a noun, in this sentence it's functioning as part of an implied adverbial phrase in the 20s. If you get that, you're fairly sophisticated. Number three. Now this is ludicrous. 
although it might very well be true, although ludicrous because of one, I mean, assuming a normal context, what is wrong with number three? Marianne. Well, the first thing is that the important idea is in the subordinate clause, yes. and the unimportant idea is in the main clause. Complete reverse of the proper subordination. Complete. One is presumably this casual, meaningless gesture, he's having a sip of water. The other is, he's predicting the enslavement and destruction of mankind. But the way the, the sentence is worded, the essential thought is given, uh, is given this took place at the same time, but the crucial thing, the main clause is he took a sip of water. Now, rewrite that, uh, Marianne, to give the main focus to the main thought. Well, I didn't because I thought those two thoughts really shouldn't be in the same sentence. Well, let's it's suppose, such a wide gap. Yeah, there is a big gap, but let's suppose a context in which you wanted to indicate his physical motion. Well, just reverse okay, it. I yeah, want to see if you can reverse the emphasis. As the president took a sip of water, he predicted the enslavement and destruction of men. As the president took a sip, he predicted. That's simple. All right, just, just, just switching the app. Now, reduce the present main clause to simply a prepositional phrase. Because I don't think it even is important enough to get a whole subordinate clause. So go down one step, yes. Taking a sip uh, Yes, taking, taking a, a sip of water, water the president predicted. predicted. That would be about as much as you could award in the normal context for that action. Now, of course, if you are imaginative, you could probably come up with a situation where this is okay. You can never say these things are absolutely wrong because it depends on the context. Suppose, for instance, the president just talks a lot and his predictions don't mean anything. And you've established that. But the water has been laced with cholera germs, strychnine or something. <laughs> and if he takes a sip, that's fatal. Then, of course, this structure is absolutely correct. As he was foaming off with the mouth, he imbibed death. But in the normal course of affairs, it's absurdly inverted. <laughs> this is why you have to know what your intention and context is. All right, uh, number four. What's wrong with number four? I'm happy to take a different person <laughs> if he or she will volunteer. But I don't want to put you on the spot by forcing you if you're not ready. Are you ready? I can only tell you what I've done with it. Okay, that's all I'm asking. What did you do with it? A debate is a forum in which two people... Very good. A debate is a forum in which two people, etc. What was the nature of your change then? After is, you are the same thing on one side as the other, right? A debate is what type of... Um, uh, part of speech. It's a noun. So you have the instinct to say, if there's a noun on one side, a noun on the other. A debate is a form. And then you said, what type of form? Very good. What is then wrong with it here? What type of construction is where two people argue back and forth? That tells you where something happened. Is that a clause? Yes. People argue, right? Introduced by the subordinate conjunction of where? What type of clause is that? Adverbial. Adverbial clause, which means it's basically functioning as an adverb, right? So therefore, we have a debate is rapidly. That's the logical structure. Noun is adverb. That's wrong. It's got to be noun is noun, or at most noun is adjective. But you can't have a debate is adverb. So you've got an adverbial place. You need a substance of some kind. What is the name of this error? Improper adverbial clause. Adverbial clause functioning as a noun. It can't be done. However, the name, practically speaking, only comes up at cocktail party. Because the main thing is to know not to do. 
Number five. What do I take from this fact that I cannot catch one person's eye? <laughs> Some of these are the same error repeated, you know, so it doesn't have to be a new one. Uh, yes. Simply, but. Oh, uh, the main point is drowned in other words that hundreds of people were killed. Hundreds of people are killed is the main point. I just say drowned in other words. Yeah. What, uh, let's be a little more grammatically. Well, it, it needs a, a clause of its own. Well, it has a clause, but it happens not to be the main clause. So you're saying the main point is not in the main clause. So we have subordinated, we made it. What is the main clause as, as worded here? I was standing idly on the corner, right? What is a subordinate clause? And this thing happened at the same time. Now you want to reverse it. Obviously the important thought is, this explosion killed hundreds of people. And by the way, I was standing on the corner of it. Right? So you reverse the subordination. So re redo that now, in order to give me a proper subordination. After standing idly on the well, you have to be careful. If you said, after standing idly on the corner for an hour, an explosion had killed hundreds of people, what implication are you open to? The explosion stood around idly and then went out and killed people. I would say an explosion occurred. It killed hundreds of people. Say it again now from the beginning. How would you redo it? After standing idly on the corner for an hour, an explosion occurred. No, no good. After standing idly, an explosion occurred. It still makes it sound like the explosion was standing. See, that's a dangling gerund, which we'll get to. Uh, uh, yes? Just switch when with that when I had been standing idly. Well, re tell me how you would work. When I had been standing idly on the corner for an hour, an explosion that killed hundreds of men occurred. Okay. Well, after I had been standing idly, an explosion occurred. But your idea, Cindy, was correct. It's just not to drop the I have. Because in this case, if you do, you leave out who's doing the standing. So you have a different noun than the next. But the idea, as far as this exercise is concerned, is to reverse the subordination. Numbers? Yes. More on the same. Yes. The explosion that killed hundreds of men. That killed hundreds of men is more important than explosions occurred. That's correct. Semantic That's way. very good. So how would you redo that? that is, we have as our main clause an explosion occurred, right. rather than an explosion that it killed hundreds killed of men. Hundreds. I hadn't even intended that when I made this up, but you're entirely right. That it killed hundreds of men is much more important than that it took place. So how would you uh, redo that then? Uh, after I had been standing idly on the corner for an hour, an explosion killed hundreds of men. Much better. Because then you're making your main clause an explosion killed hundreds of men. And that it occurred is obviously taken for granted. Yes. Aren't these two units kind of loosely related? We have to presuppose in the grammatical exercises that there's some context to justify these things. You see, if I made them too closely related, you would then raise your hand and say, well, couldn't one be as more important than the other? So I have to make them so disparate that you see the point. And then, of course, someone will say, but these shouldn't be in the same sentence, and you can't win. <laughs> They're exercises. You have to bear with them. <laughs> Number six. Uh, Tom. Well, I wrote that as, although it was raining in the morning, it cleared up later. Yes, although it was raining in the morning, it cleared up later. What's wrong with the while? Well, it implies that it cleared up at the same time it was raining. Yes, while is one of those conjunctions, which means partly a concession. You know, while this is true nevertheless, but partly also temporal. You know, he stirred the soup while the, the pot over flowed. And therefore, with the temporal implication in that conjunction, it makes it sound like it was raining at the same time that it cleared up later. So it's ludicrous. So that is a poor conjunction. So one choice is make it all go, but then you're simply subordinate. You're saying the big thing is to clear it up later, mind you, it rained earlier. 
But suppose you wanted to make them equal. You wanted both of the same importance. You could use a different conjunction, a coordinating conjunction. Uh, yes, in the middle, yes. It was raining in the morning, but it cleared up later. But it cleared up later, right. And then you're making them equal, co equal, coordinate. Okay, last Tuesday an event occurred in my life that I shall always remember. Now, this is very typical of the way uh, people do speak or write. What's wrong with this? Yes. Uh, last Tuesday is misplaced. It, the way it is in the sentence, it sounds as if it's the most important thing. And no, I don't think I can accept that comment because the fact that it's at the beginning doesn't make it the most important thing. And uh, it simply is put before the structure so we can keep the main structure. An event occurred in my life. Well, uh, it would be more emphatic if I say an event occurred in my life last Tuesday. So it's not that, that, that last Tuesday is given too much importance. You couldn't say that. You know, many sentences can begin with short introductory phrases. Uh, in the beginning, come, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a perfectly valid English. English. You just start off when it happened, you get that aside, and then you give your main structure. So it can't be that here. Something is misplaced, but not last Tuesday. Now look, an event occurred in my life that I shall always remember. Now the general rule is, the modifier is taken in conjunction with the first possible thing. Now, last Tuesday could only go with the curve because it's time. But what modifier would very easily be misinterpreted here? If I ignore your hand, it's only because you've answered many times. All right, great. Uh, the way it's written, it's uh, the life that you're always going to remember right. instead of the event. Right. The life that I shall always remember. It's as though you say an event occurred in my life that I shall always remember as opposed to my other life that I forgot. <laughs> now that obviously is not the intention. It's an event that I shall always remember occurred in my life. But now, it's not really necessary to have that whole... So this is a misplaced adjective clause, just like number one. But it's not necessary to have that whole verbiage. How could you condense that? Yes. An unforgettable. Yeah, an unforgettable, a memorable event occurred. You do not, when you edit, after all, this comes up when you change your own wording, when you edit. You don't have to just shift a clause around. Always remember, you can take a clause down to a word in many cases and make it much more compact and expressive. Number eight. As Aristotle before him, Aquinas was a champion of logic. Now here's a person being deliberately literary, trying to show that he knows the difference here between one word and another. <clears throat> he wouldn't be caught using, you know, when doesn't taste good like a cigarette should. So the message he got is whenever like is used, put in it. <laughs> so now he would want to say like Aristotle before him, but it sounds too natural. Consequently, it thinks to be grammatical, you must go against your instinct. So he sticks in as, and of course it's wrong, because in this usage, <coughs> what? Well, you have that as with a clause. There is no verb, it's no clause. So uh, there's absolutely no, nothing to justify as, it should simply be like Aristotle before. Yes? You see as with It's very awkward. You could put a verb in, but it's very awkward because it's needless. There's no reason to make a clause out of it when a phrase will, will do to perfectly well. Yes? How do you know that the, the verb isn't implied? Depends on the context, but when you use like, you're making it explicit that it's not implied. Yeah, but he used as. I know, but he used as without telling us what the verb is. Aristotle did before him, but it's not a do because it simply has a state. He was. So as Aristotle was, uh, Aquinas was is a needless repetition when we have such a construction as what? So it would be right if it was as Aristotle did 
did before him Aquinas champion to logic? If you want to say all that, you could. But why not simply say, like Aristotle, Aquinas was a champion? That's perfectly grammatical. It's the exact use of the word like. There's nothing in the reason in the world to put in a verb there. No reason. Number nine. Now this is Lincoln reversed. <laughs> the same exact words of thought that we get only one thing to it. Nearly what? What do we do? Yes. We took the noun clauses from the original and made them into your main clauses. In other words, we switched our subordination. We reversed the subordination. The world will little note what we say here. His focus was on what the world will do. Now, by rewriting it, what did we make it? Instead of a commentator on the world, he becomes, in effect, completely self-focused. We are saying things here, which, by the way, the world will little note, you see, entirely change the focus. You make him, in effect, by implication, sort of a pompous mediocrity instead of a spectator of all history. It's just by switching uh, your uh, emphasis. It makes an enormous difference if you put something in a main clause. So I just gave you that as an example of how a perfectly familiar sentence takes on an entirely different cast by switching your uh, subordination. Number 10. The psychological session, which was the turning point in her recovery from schizophrenia, then began. Try to get somebody over here who wants to volunteer. Yes. Well, if you said began is misplaced, how would you reverse no, then that? Then began. Then began. All right, tell me, give me your new sentence. Then began a psychological session, which was the turning point in her recovery. From well, all you've done, you said then began a session, which was the turning point. You kept exactly the same structure. All you did is put the beginning first and make it a little archaic by reversing verb and subject. But you have not changed the essential error. What is the main clause in this sentence as word? Now think, what is the main clause in number 10? No, no. The main clause has to be a subject and a verb which together would stand alone. Recovery. No, recovery is not the subject. Recovery is part of the phrase in her recovery. Session. What began? Session. Session. A psychological session then began, the main clause. And which was the turning point in her recovery from schizophrenia tells you what? What kind of session? It's an adjective clause. Now, we have two units here then. A session began, that's given the main clause. And, by the way, it cured her of schizophrenia, that's thrown aside. Now, obviously, in a normal context, that is what? Whatever. Uh, reversal of a subordination. A reversal of subordination, right. The nature of the session in a normal context, if it's this momentous, is infinitely more important than that it began. So you would say something like, what? How would you reword it? Yes. Well, I would say the recovery from schizophrenia began after a psychological session. And then in that case, recovery would be the subject. You could reword it that way. The recovery from schiz her recovery from schizophrenia began after, after a psychological session. You're not giving the exact same thought. Because here the point is not that her recovery began, because that could be simply coincident. The thought here is this was the turning point. This was the causal factor, you see. This brought about the recovery, not just the temporal juxtaposition. So if you want to keep the exact thought here, what would you do simply to reverse the subordination as an exercise? But keeping the same thought. Yes. The turning point in the recovery from schizophrenia, a psychological session then began. Say it again. The turning point in her recovery from schizophrenia, a psychological session. Well, you're putting a psychological session in apposition. You're saying 
the turning point in her recovery from schizophrenia, comma, a psychological session, comma, then began. Well, you're switching our emphasis then because you're saying the turning point began. And I'm suggesting, let us just try to reverse it here and say that the main clause is the psychological session was the turning point because that would be the normal. That it began is not that essential, but what it was in a normal context. So how would you do that? To keep as your main clause, the session was the turning point. And throw away began. Make it a minor substitution. Yes. Well, I have a psychological session then began dash, the turning point in her recovery from schizophrenia. Did the same thing. You kept the same main clause and just put it as, a, as a, in apposition. You still didn't give me what I'm specifically asking for. I'm not saying that would always be wrong. But what I want is a sentence where the main clause is the psychological session was the turning. And began is not the main clause. You see, you're still telling me the main clause is it began, which is not so important. Yes? The psychological session which began the, was the turning point. Or That's the way you'd have to do it. The psychological session which began then was the turning point. Then the which began is a subsidiary issue. And your main clause is the session was the turning point. Okay, now I'm not saying all these others are wrong, but just as an exercise. Number 11. We offered a proposal to repeal the Income Tax Amendment, which is extremely controversial. Yes. Well, uh, the front door, yes. He offered a proposal to repeal the extremely controversial Income Tax Amendment? Well, that's extremely controversial. What, what, what advantage does that have over what's here? You just it, ident it identifies what. Well, it doesn't here make it clear that it's the income tax amendment which is controversial? What's the difference between to repeal the income tax amendment which is controversial or to repeal the controversial income tax amendment? I didn't think it was clear what was extremely controversial. It isn't. Yeah. <laughs> but doesn't it make that, it clear? That, well, if it was the controversial income tax amendment, what would that imply? If I said the tall man is in the room, Presumably, there are non-tall men, right? If his proposal was to repeal the controversial income tax amendment, as against what other type? Non they're non-controversial, but there's only one. So presumably, he doesn't even need it to modify income tax amendment, but proposal. proposal. In which case, this is a this is adjective clause and should be offered, now give it to me, with just an adjective, no clause. We offered an extremely, an extremely controversial, controversial proposal right. to repeal that. Is that squinting construction? No, because squinting has to be in the middle looking in two opposite directions, and this is at the end. This is just ambiguous, misplaced. Number 12. <laughs> Oh, number 12. <laughs> number 12. He liked the books which were in the bookcase, which he had bought at the auction he attended during the fair, which was held at Christmas, and which held volumes which were famous in many circles, which he encountered when he pursued his avocation, which he enjoyed. <laughs> now, there's a very simple error in that, <laughs> which is what? Oh, let's run on to no, it's not run on. Grammatically, run on means that you're starting a new main clause without punctuation. And this is not. It's all a bunch of subordinates. But oh, it is so many subordinates that it's beyond the mind's ability to take in. So it's excessive subordination. And also it has a lot of Overland. books which were in the bookcase which during the fair which. So it's what we call overlapping subordination. It's excessive and overlapping on top of it. Now, I'm not going to take the time <laughs> to rewrite this because the thought is senseless to begin with. I just put it together as an example. But if you want to know, this is how, this is the best I could do to strip this down to some kind of comprehensive thought. Did you try to uh, condense this? Yeah. All right, better than doing that now. We'll <laughs> save that for next time. <laughs> I got it down to, let me see,
Uh, A.T. Work. I think, if I count them correct. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Excuse me. Now, I'll see if you can beat that. This is the <laughs> basic idea and make this an exercise in condensing, which we'll take up next time. You didn't drop any ideas at all. Uh, let me see. I dropped a few that I thought weren't too significant. <laughs> but I presumably could defend that if it comes down. Because there's only so much you can retain. All right, number 13. Like his, so we'll take that up next time. Like his colleague, his conduct was wicked. Now this again is a tricky one. This is the type professors love to put on tests because every, even if you deal all your homework and study the notes and everything we didn't cover. Uh, who's uh, new here? Yes. The note, yeah. His conduct was as wicked as that of his colleague. That of his colleague. Now you can make it was as wicked as that of, that's okay, but the crucial thing is the comparison is not between his colleague and his conduct. It's not the conduct was like the colleague. The colleague is a man and the conduct is behavior, right? So this is, a, this is an inexact thought. You mean his conduct is being compared to his colleague's conduct, right? So you, you don't need to switch the like. The like is perfectly okay. But to make it in a proper use of like, it has to be two things which really are being compared. Like Aristotle was like a quine. His conduct, conduct is like his colleagues, or that of his colleague. You get the, the parable. So it should really be like that of his colleague. His conduct was weak. Number 14. Most of our trouble is because. part of speech is most there. Be careful. Not an adjective, because there's no noun that is modified. What part of speech is most? Noun. Can't be a noun. Does anybody know? It stands for a noun, but it doesn't, it isn't a noun. What would that make? Pronoun. Pronoun. So we have a structure, most is because. Most is a pronoun. I have a Hector here. Um, it's a substantive, is, and then because we think too little about ethics, what type of construction uh, is that? What type of construction is because uh, we think too little about ethics? That's a clause, right? What type of clause? Giving the reason for an event. Adverbial. Adverbial clause, which functions as an adverb. So this is again the structure. Most is because. Substantive is adverb. It's just like the debate example. Improper adverbial clause. What should we change it to? Most of our trouble is? That. That would make a noun clause, which is the appropriate substantive, but even there, you really mean the causes, right? So the more exact wording would be, the cause of most of our trouble is that. And then you have a noun standing your thought completely. That's again, improper adverbial clause. Yes? When you say it's from, Most of our trouble is from, is not an exact expression, you really mean comes from this derives from, flows from. Is from is too elliptical. I wouldn't think that's too good. And now let's whip in number 15 here. What's wrong with 15? Yes. You have the uh, reversal here. Reversal of subordination. 
the conclusion is obviously much more important, right? How would you redo it? After thinking a great deal about my problems, I finally concluded that I am basically worthless. That's fine. That's fine. After thinking, I finally concluded. Or you could, suppose you didn't want that I am worthless, which is after all subordinate uh, clause. Suppose you wanted a main clause for that because it's so important. You could say, after thinking, etc., I finally reached a conclusion, cold. I am worthless, period. Then you give a main clause to your big thought, you see, so there's no, no uh, minimizing it. Okay, that is the 15. I don't think we have time to take up the last. Just out of curiosity, <laughs> we got a second left on the table? About a minute. About a minute, all right. Who took what is the main clause of those five? And we'll take the full sentence next time. Just tell me, what did you take as the main clause, Todd? Grammar is worth studying. Grammar is worth studying. How many agree? How many took a different main clause? What did you Subordination say? Subordination in English. Subordination is difficult. Who took a different one? Yes. The teacher in the course mm -hmm. goes too fast. Goes too fast. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear those next time. Thank you.